Teaching Society. And this morning, I want to uh, bring to forward uh, a topic, namely uh, regarding the teaching of the uh, instrument. And uh, it's about developing a standards for teaching uh, the instrument, namely towards in the future in the 21st century, when uh, we have different learning habits. So here's uh, the gist. That's uh, traditionalists or traditional people, when they teach the Gu Xin, they uh, critique that the uh, rise of uh, a scaled Qin industry or the capitalist movement of uh, this new Qin industry today is uh, over-commercialized or your uh, tong uh, way. That is to uh, unculturally, uncharacteristic of the uh, so-called Goya, and when they say this, they really mean imply uh, the uninvolvement of money and the uh, devoid of the uh, worldly vulgar values and so forth. And they instead create an imagined past where uh, space and there's a space and time ruled by a Confucian order uh, of virtue, and there's. The Gu Qin itself as an art is an altruistic transmission of uh, this knowledge of playing the Gu Qin and musicology and so forth, and the absence of worldly trappings of money and capital. But reality is, as capitalist consumerism pervades our uh, modern society and our modern living, our thought patterns and choices ultimately uh, dictate our actions. So we need to review the uh, art and pedagogy of the Gu Xin as it relates to us in modern life and our students in the audience of the 21st century. So this paper will uh, diverge from such traditional critiques in saying that, oh, the reason why students don't learn well is because uh, they're too uh, obsessed with money and fortune or that uh, they're too obsessed about how expensive their chin is. And instead, I will critique that uh, the modern industry's intent on destroying tradition, it's uh, not really there, but instead it is this new industry's failure to uh, meet to the expectations and the imaginations of its clientele, namely our students, that is actually uh, creating this shortfall of uh, people who are reaching success towards attaining uh, mastery in this field. And uh, naturally, towards the ex expectations of the plural globalized market of such students and its consumption habits. So, let us begin. <clears throat> what uh, makes a thing, for example, a, the chin or the service of Gu Qin lessons? Culture, modern. So when we talk about uh, the modernization of Gu Qin culture or the modernization of the Gu Qin industry, what do we usually think of? Well, if you think of the critiques that people have made, such as uh, the examples I've listed before, they would say that, oh, you need, for example, uh, standardization, for example, exams, or uh, a ways to tell which piece is harder, and so forth. You would think that this kind of quantification or to make more chains in industrial scale, they end up basically to, down to two thoughts. One is westernization, and the other is industrialization, and often they mean the same thing to easternized, to Chinese impressions. And in contrast, tradition, the Chinese thing, is seen as a, a counterpoint or an antithesis to that, namely that of the anti-capital and the anti-western, and arguably even anti-universal. So no human rights or equality or democratic values and such things. And uh, when we come to the critique of this uh, idea of industrialized commodification and the creation of something, usually art, the earliest person we can go to can go back all the way to uh, the Greek philosophers. But when we really think about what it means to us as modern people today, we begin with uh, Walter Benjamin, 
the uh, German philosopher in the 20th century, when uh, he wrote at that time the much debated uh, art in the age of mechanical reproduction. And in that work, he wrote that uh, in the past, say you have a Greek person making a statue in oh, marble or something like that, you can only create one statue. That statue is real and it's authentic because some guy has labored it for hours or days or months and so forth. But with the birth of the printing press, one guy has an idea, writes a story, prints the thing, and hundreds of thousands of copies spew out from there. So which one of those copies is the original work? Which one has that kind of labor of the hours and hours of uh, sweat and pain and tears into it? None of them? All of them? Or is there a fraction of it? That was the question that Benjamin asked in uh, his work. And the, question, uh, the problem of that uh, authenticity, that blood and sweat, he called it into a, an aura. So he discussed whether uh, the aura is perfectly preserved or is it divided or something like that. And that's the question you have from classical art uh, historians or critiquers versus uh, the investigation of when we reproduce something and uh, do we really have uh, what is true art or what is true culture then now that we have uh, spread it with new technology. And if you move forward a long time in the 20th century, you have uh, Theodore Adorno and Guy Debord. These people were experienced through Nazism and uh, the Second World War. And to these guys, Theodore Adorno and Guy Debord, they think that uh, stuff like this you see on the right is evil. It's bad. It's absolutely horrendous. Why? Because with this uh, age of industrialized art you have here, the problem is people, when you say uh, you have the Mona Lisa and you have the, uh, a print of Mona Lisa, now the person who owns the printer and prints out all these uh, copies of the Mona Lisa, this guy who owns the printing press dictates the terms, the quality, and even the interpretation of what these prints of Mona Lisa could mean to you by determining the price and the caption underneath it. And that's what Theodore Adorno so much fears in industrialized art because it is the collusion between the state and the capital that uh, starts affecting the minds and the uh, way how people think en masse that becomes thought control. Uh, and it dictates the way how we think through the interpretation and mediation of our access and thinking to art and ideas. It is stifling and it silences critique and divergent voices. In the case of Guy Debord, it gets worse. Art becomes an instrument of not only institutional control and horror, but the consumers <laughs> of the art control themselves when these people who uh, pursue the art, no longer really actually pursue the art, but pursue the image of the art, and then they go on producing the image of the image of the image of the art, and uh, he, call, he creates this cycle, which he calls the spectacle. And the unfortunate thing is that the entire modern society revolves around making images of the images of the images of the spectacle, meaning that we ultimately chase after things that are not really that thing anymore. So put into Gujin example, uh, we don't really go after the chin as a prestige object anymore. We go after the prestige of the Gujin, which may be made by some famous name. And the mere fact that we hear of a person who owns this name, or that you know a certain person, or that you may have heard of a certain piece, will bring you that kind of stature and that elated sense of happiness from knowing this culture is enough for some people. The fact that you may listen to your Guqin music on your, in your car is somewhat uh, that you are a part of this dilettantism. And that's the exact problem that Guy Debord describes as modern society and the vanity of the society of the spectacle.
Now, put that into a modern sense, uh, we have similar <coughs> critiques in uh, the Guqin world. For example, in Lao Chuo Wa's uh, compilation from a Guqin conference in Hong Kong back in 2010, Tam Mei and Nan Hong Yan wrote uh, collaboratively a paper on, uh, well, a field study of uh, some salon, Xin Salon, Xin Guan, in Nanjing. And what Nan Hong Yan found was that uh, it was overwhelming with vulgar greed and nouveau riche folly. So uh, instead of talking about the Goya stuff of Guqin art, most people were concerned about how expensive a Guqin was, who has the more expensive or the more famous Guqin, <coughs> or that uh, people are taking Guqin classes from reputed masters and they're gloating off of that, or the fact that they are just taking Guqin life in itself, and the fact that they're learning Guqin makes them somewhat of an elevated status, an imaginary participation into the uh, venerated tradition of the scholar literati. Now, Omi Bergin, Bergin wrote a similar thing, but he has a more positive light. He describes this as a uh, Baudrillardian hyper-reality. Basically, the same thing. But uh, he describes this as dreams and aspirations of uh, a young modern society hoping to create a rebirth of a, uh, the scholarly literati and the elite kind of lifestyle that indeed once existed in Chinese society. But in the midst of creation or the construction of such a dream, they are actually making a new reality. And that you can't say that these people are fakes because they have already, through their actions, created the new scholarly literati living and the lifestyle. And with so much of this happening in real life, with so much in demand, why are then so many of these new students trying to do this, but fail halfway, like Icarus and his wings melting when he, he flies close to the sun? So why are so many of them uh, lear trying to learn the Gu Xin, uh, despite the fact that now we have the internet and so many teachers and an unprecedented amount of new chins entering the market. So with so much material access, shouldn't learning the Gu Jin be easier and more accessible than ever before? <coughs> what kind of barriers are there that's preventing these people from successfully mastering the subject? And how does one's uh, background, family background, uh, actually affect how we learn and appreciate the Gu Jin? How do we uh, make our teaching resonate with each of those groups? So for example, <coughs> how does one who grew up in China learn differently from, say, someone who grew up in America? So we often hear this idea that uh, foreigners often make better students. They learn better. Uh, Gao Hong, a pe famous pipa teacher who now teaches in America, uh, wrote in a Weibo essay not so long ago, around in March, saying that uh, there's a common question that people keep on asking her. How can Americans learn to, uh, to play Chinese music so well and so soon when they don't really even understand the language or its culture? And I find this to be uh, hugely ironic, considering that I grew up in a North American society and it's usually the Asians who learn things faster and with more depth, because it's the Asians who uh, often study harder for exams and uh, remember more things, and they're the usual nerds. And uh, here comes the model minority myth, which uh, is, in the long run, quite negative of an image, because by saying that Asians learn better, because it's in their genes to, under to uh, be more knowledgeable. But here, this uh, trope is reversed. This culturalism is finally exposed. Because in here, Cao <coughs> Hong exposes the fact that the Chinese uh, learning pattern is focused on growth and repetition, whereas Western learners focus today on uh, deconstructing ideas and questioning authority, so namely their teachers when in a class. Does that mean that only Westerners can question 
teachers in the class? Does that mean that all Chinese people learn uh, only by rote? Obviously, this is uh, not so much of a ethnic or racial nature, but actually disparities in the learning objectives or the perceived learning styles from the modern, industrialized school systems that we see present day in the later half of the 20th and early half of the 21st century in East Asia and in the West. <coughs> Namely, the thing that is being critiqued by those uh, traditional Qin artists is this uh, unfamiliarity or the rejection of the modern school system <coughs> in contrast to their perceptions of what they received as their Qin education in form of Kou Chuan Xin Shou or oral transmission and their Shi Tu Guan Xi, their Magister and Magi relationship. So uh, let me give you a bit of a counter example, if, you, if I may. <coughs> in the past, not every person who studies the Gu Xin studies in the way that we have in terms of slowly uh, getting the piece, learning our fingerings, and so forth. In the past, there are another group of people who actually received a Gujin education, say, within one day, and then they're suddenly thrown on stage. And these people are the Ya Yu court musicians. The way how they're taught are uh, recorded in uh, ritual manuals, such as the Pan Gu Yu Shu, where they have a very short description of, uh, for example here, of a bare bones training curriculum. They're basically thrown a chin, and they're taught that when the orchestra plays a certain note, they are to uh, basically play rapid successions of uh, the same pitch on two or more different strings. And the way that uh, they remember the positions, as you see in uh, this illustration here, they're taught to slip uh, and glue slips of paper with the pitch names uh, attached to a certain position. So for example here, uh, you see on the ninth way, the dot on the right, it says Tai Su Gu Xian Lin Zhong Nan Nan Lu Yin Zhong. So it just basically means, uh, let's see, D, E, G, A, B. That's just what it means. So when the rest of the orchestra plays a certain note, they just go like ding dong ding dong ding ding dong ding dong ding ding dong ding, like that. So that's how all they need to know. So all they need to do is just look down on the chin when the orchestra hears that sound, they just keep on playing. That's all the education that they receive. So it's not exactly there's only one way to learn the Gu Chin. It depends on how much they need for, to know for what purpose that they serve. So similarly today, we must consider the uh, students' expectations of uh, learning the Gu Chin as a conduit to Chinese heritage or uh, there needs to be a more varied, a generalist, uh, demand-based kind of context curriculum for the instrument and the musical tradition altogether. Meanwhile, modern students need to uh, look forward that, uh, that not only today do they need to learn uh, heavy with a performance-based curriculum, playing a large range of traditional repertoire, but they also have a need to learn how to transcribe and uh, play modern pop repertoire. Now in the past 10 years, I know that uh, Master Gong Yi and many others have been uh, transcribing and publishing pieces in, uh, of, new, of new Gu Qin repertoire, coming in from new, uh, pop, new compositions, be it uh, transcription of pop songs and so, far, and so forth. But to date, there is uh, there are some books on Dapu, but there are very few introductions or methodologies to learning how to transcribe a certain piece from another instrument or in your head, composition in other words, onto the Gu Qin. And the current way of teaching the Gu Qin does not teach this skill of transferring the music in your brain onto your fingers. And that would be essential. Uh, to our current curriculum, for example. Or, for another example, how we use uh, the right tuning. How do we determine what right uh, uh, to use when we're 
transcribing a certain piece from a certain scale, for example. This kind of skill would be essential, but is not taught in the current, cur current curriculum. Just a few days ago in the uh, master class, someone asked Master Li Xiangting, there are many pop songs going on. Is it possible for uh, ma you, Master Li, to transcribe a few? And Master Li didn't know how to respond. My initial answer for her would be, well, why don't you do it yourself? But I know inside myself that the answer to why she was asking this question in the first place is because to her, it didn't occur to her mind that she had the skills or the uh, need that she would need to get down and do it herself. Because she was not taught of the possibility that she needs to and should be doing this work herself. Just a quick reminder that we are now 20 minutes into the presentation. How much time? Uh, now it's 20 minutes, so oh dear. it's a full okay. I'll make it quick. So uh, overall, the same thing. Uh, and the problem is with the rote style of drilling, especially uh, in the modern curriculum when they drill on not, uh, they, st they don't start with Xiao Long Chao and Xiao uh, Yun and so forth with actual pieces. They don't learn technique from uh, playing the actual pieces themselves, but with drills and exercises. The problem is that this uh, becomes a kind of purely technical exercise and becomes con they become conscious about it, and they enter into what I call exam mode. And uh, when in this kind of exam mode, they realize that this stuff is only important for the sake of the next drill or the next text. <coughs> And uh, they will attempt, they will know subconsciously to forget it afterwards. And this is the cause of inauthentic learning. And uh, the, a person's attention span can only go for so long. In my experience of teaching uh, Gu Jin students, only a year. So if they stop playing for a long time and pick it up again, usually they will remember what they learned in the first year. But what happens afterwards is another question. So uh, my example is uh, a, a girl named Student E, I shall call her, and uh, she is so used to the exam mentality at school that uh, when I give her a piece to memorize, she can memorize and understand uh, concepts and techniques and songs very quickly. But as soon as she's passed a test that I have arbitrarily given her, within two weeks she will have forgotten everything. And that's the problem with uh, the, basically the East Asian or the 19th century Prussian school model. So my uh, <coughs> advocacy would be uh, to see from the strengths and weaknesses of this and uh, to you capitalize on that in the uh, best way possible. These people are able to process large amounts of information and are able to do research on their own. To that end, we should provide uh, as much information as possible on paper or in digital resources and allow them to search for it when the need arises. They will learn upon when the, they feel that they need to do this. However, as teachers, we don't have to drill this into their mind. Rather, we should be the guide, guidance teachers who uh, will lead them to such resources when the need arises. So we will open the doors up to them. They may uh, struggle in the uh, short run with so, so much amount of information, but as they need it, they will find it, this kind of mentality. They will uh, do well in the readily available uh, digital age that we live in the 21st century. So uh, I bring about the uh, old adage about the Chinese word xuewen, where true knowledge comes from knowing how to ask the right questions. So I'll just make this a quick mention. And uh, <coughs> as I mentioned earlier, yes, with uh, the counterpoint to drilling in uh, rote memorization would be to ask the right questions. So instead of the teacher just simply giving exercises, what's more important is that the student themselves feel value in what they are learning. If the teacher is uh, teaching a certain exercise to a certain piece, like for example, uh, I'm teaching them how to play fan yin with liang xiao yin with opening few notes, and they feel like this is not a challenge to them, and they feel like at the time that they want to learn something more difficult, for example, uh, mei hua, mei hua san no, it's way beyond their league, 
but if I guide them slowly with uh, that they are interested, something that they're interested in, and uh, over time, they'll, uh, if they go past the hurdle, they will feel like they will have achieved more and uh, have a sense of accomplishment. Uh, is, uh, I believe that is in our uh, role as teachers that we should make them feel this kind of accomplishment that they have learned something through their own efforts. And if the uh, student has a clear idea on how to progress uh, their learning experience, then we should let them, and it is our job as teachers to fill them in on what they might have missed. So in brief conclusion, so it is our job as educators, that A, natural A students are fine, but it is our job as educators to bring the B grade students into enlightenment, into the A's, and the struggling students, the C students, into passing students, the B students. And the key to doing that is to inspire them with, genu with genuine motivation, with their own reasons for learning the Guqin. It is our job to give them a se the searing burst of enlightenment, to provide them an understanding that there are these many subjects and these many fields these many scopes within the field of the Gu Xin. There are these many things to talk about. There are these many things to understand. And it is important that uh, their attention span, the things that they learn, uh, will stick in their head in their formative year, in their first year. So it is important that we get uh, a bit of everything down to the basics, no matter how mundane or no matter how uh, specialized it may be, but a foundation needs to be built within the first year of their Guqin education. And I call out to fellow scholars and students in the international uh, community of Guqin scholars and students uh, to reach out for more, uh, sharing their experiences, sharing their ideas, and uh, ultimately not only become consumers of this uh, field, but to also produce so more text, more foreign textbooks, more communications, more platforms, and uh, hope that we'll be sharing ideas more often. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, before we go to question, I actually would like to make a comment. I uh, like to reference, as you may, with uh, Adorno and Benjamin. Um, there's really a problem with copies, as we also saw in my presentation with Roger Riar, and which copy is more real, more fake, or more authentic. Yes. Um, uh, I would suggest you look into Paul Ricoeur and the French, uh, because I think they have a very interesting perspective to um, what is a work of art. And Paul Ricoeur, he sees the work of art in the, with the emphasis on working. So if, mm -hmm. that if you have an encounter with something, even if it's a bad copy, uh, it will work somehow while you interpret it actually the working Absolutely. of the art uh, so it could actually be a print or a secondary copy as long as it works in you and i think that that would be interesting to to look i'm for actually something. applying adorno and the board's theory specifically to the uh, product not the art of guqin education so guqin classes you get in salons right. it's not the same thing it is a uh, reproduction, an industrialized form of the Guqin lesson. So whereas in the past, you have the authentic form of you sit next to the, across from the master and you get uh, a piece slowly passed down to you. Now it's textbooks and class, a standardized form. It's no longer that if you have a question, the teacher can flexibly answer you. That's what I'm trying to get at with uh, industrialized Xin lessons. Correct. Okay, um, so any questions? Yes, yes please. So your um, students mainly told me about young students? The youngest student I have was in grade nine, Zhongshan. So that would be around, what, 14 years old? But the bulk of my students, as you see in this picture, are uh, university undergrad age students, so 18 to 24. So you don't have, so it doesn't include students in middle age? Oh, I also have people who are in working age. 
Yes. So basically, <coughs> so basically, eighteen and above. I've had ha I've had had uh, students who are like in their sixties and seventies as well. Yes, the greater difference I find is cultural or so-called cultural. Uh, what I would like to call is their education upbringing. So it depends on whether they're brought up in an Asian school system or whether they're brought in a modern uh, American, Euro-American school system where they're encouraged to think for themselves, challenge this uh, teacher and do critical thinking. You'll find that uh, in university, especially university professors around here, you'll find that it's very difficult for you to pull Chinese or East Asian students to ask questions in class. That's the problem I'm picking at right here. We have time for one last question. Anyone else want to ask or add something to this? Um, you mean the industrial style teaching, but not every student have the same time and they always in the same like speed uh, learning. So how you differentiate that in the one group? Right. That's exactly the reason why I don't teach big classes. I always teach one-on-one. -on -one. So one-to-one. But one. Uh, <coughs> it's not that I disagree or like a, go completely doffing the idea of mass classes. But the question is, we need to develop a better way to develop the mass class so that we can allow for people to learn at different speeds. So put this in a generic classroom sense. If you have a teacher on the blackboard teaching the same things, the problem is that you have people who are already know the content and are dozing off in class because they don't care, they already know the stuff. You have the people who are right on track and they'll perform in class like this. And then you have the people who are just confused and they go like, what's going on? And uh, they're in class and they try to struggle in the back of the class. So you have, but no matter what, the teacher stands in the front and continues teaching. That's the problem with the uh, modern day tech classroom style teaching. And uh, this is not something you can fix for the guqin because the problem lies in the classroom system. If you want to fix this system, you'll have to fix the whole classroom method itself. So what I'm proposing is with uh, new ideas coming out from the field uh, in the education sector, for example, digital learning, for example, uh, tutorial uh, systems, uh, you have a bit more flexibility with their new classroom systems so that it goes more one-on-one -on -one through uh, having more s smaller tutorial groups or digitized versions of teacher replacements. We're still in the works about this. We don't have an answer about this yet. This is excellent and I would like to thank Mrs. Wood for the presentation.